my name is Alejandro Rourke, and I'm the executive director for Hispanic Technology and Telecommunications Partnership. HETP is a CEO roundtable of 16 of the country's oldest and largest Latino civil rights organizations who work in coalition to promote the access, adoption, and full utilization of technology and telecommunications resources by the Latino community across the United States through our community engagement, congressional education, and by serving as a national voice for Latinos in tech and telecommunications partnership, um, HTTP member organizations work to support the social, political, and the economic advancement of Americans of Latino descent by facilitating access to high quality education, economic opportunity, and effective healthcare through the use of technology tools and resources. Today, having broadband access is is inextricably linked to our health, our well-being, and our economic security. And this is especially true for the Latino community, Black and Indigenous communities of color, as well as rural and low-income households, um, or families who are experiencing economic hardships because of the coronavirus, or who face compounding obstacles to establishing and sustaining a reliable at-home broadband connection. Central to the solution of bridging the digital divide is our ability to extend broadband infrastructure to every home at an affordable price and to create inclusive tools so that everybody can participate regardless of zip code, race, or ability. Um, today, I have the pleasure of joining uh, Maria Town um, to our kitchen table conversations on race, technology, and the future of everything as a part of our um, conversation series for our Digital Inclusion Summit. So Maria, thank you so much for making it the time to uh, connect with me today. You know, throughout your career, you've been an advocate for the rights and needs of people with disabilities at both the municipal level with the city of Houston and then at the national level, serving as a senior associate for the White House Office of Public Engagement. And now as a CEO of American Association for People with Disabilities, you work to convene, connect, and connect people with disabilities and catalyze um, for inclusive change to increase the political and economic power of people with disabilities. Do you mind sharing with us a little bit about your background, the work of AAPD, and some of your top priority issues? Absolutely. Um, Alejandro, thank you so much for that very kind introduction and for all of the work that you do to break down barriers and create opportunity for uh, people of Latin descent with technology. Um, it's, again, as you mentioned, to introduce myself, my name is Maria Town, and I serve as the president and CEO of the American Association of People with Disabilities. Um, technology has been really central to, to my life. I will uh, uh, disclose a little bit of my age. I am a millennial. <clears throat> and uh, to talk about the difference that technology can make in the lives of disabled people, I can share a very personal story. So I was born shortly before the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. And this is the landmark transformational piece of civil rights legislation that prohibits discrimination based on disability status. Um, and so I was born with a disability. It was very clear from the moment I arrived that I would uh, go on to live with a disability for the rest of my life. And, um, you know, the, the doctors could have told my parents, uh, she won't walk, she won't talk, you probably need to institutionalize her. But instead, they told my parents, she probably won't walk, she probably won't talk, but don't worry, there'll be technology. Now, that statement from those physicians set an expectation for my family that I would be able to live in the community, to be educated in a mainstream school and have a job. Now, admittedly, uh, you know, more than 30 years after the passage of, uh, of after my birth and 30 years after the passage of the ADA, we see that technology has created great opportunities for people with disabilities, again, to access our communities, to ad ad uh, advance our civil rights, but we still have a long way to go. Um, as many opportunities as technology has created for people with disabilities, it has cre also created new barriers that we don't have as many tools to navigate. I'll give you an example. Uh, tr uh, transit network companies like Uber and Lyft have said that they don't have to uh, follow the Americans with Disabilities Act because they're not transportation companies, they're technology companies. Um, so there are some major gaps 
um, around <clears throat> uh, inclusive tech and what we think of as tech and how how it uh, how it relates to the disability community that AAPD is trying to fill. Um, AAPD is a cross disability civil rights organization, meaning that we fight to advance the rights of all 61 million people with disabilities across the United States. Uh, disability is an incredibly diverse identity. It includes people like me who were born disabled, those who uh, maybe grow older and age into disability, or potentially someone who has survived COVID and is now living with lifelong chronic fatigue. So with that, I'll turn things back over to you. Uh, no, thank you for that, that great introduction to, to yourself and to the work um, that, 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 that you are leading. I think these are all very important issues. And I think that, you know, your perspective helps us all um, kind of uh, understand the specific blind spots that we all kind of hold when we think about inclusion, when we think about tech, and when we think about the things that maybe some of us take for granted, which is a part of our everyday life. Um, and so AAPD really works on a broad range of issues and hosts a variety of programs like your Disability Equality Index, your work to foster civic engagement and protect um, voter rights of Americans with disabilities, as well as working to increase the representation and visibility of the disability community. Um, could you share with us kind of how does the role of technology play in the lives of people with, with the disabilities um, on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And why is developing inclusive tech you know, critically important for the community that you serve? Sure. Um, so just like everyone else, technology plays a instrumental role in the day-to-day -day lives of people with disabilities. And to be clear, that's if we can afford it and if we can get access to it in the first place. So I really want to emphasize the importance of creating, developing um, <clears throat> affordable, accessible technology. And if the tech itself isn't affordable outright, creating programs that make it affordable. Um, let's talk about uh, voting, very timely topic. Um, so with uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, we have seen many states enhance their vote by mail absentee ballot processing. Um, well, vote by mail is inherently inaccessible to people who are blind or low vision, uh, to people who have learning disabilities or cognitive disabilities, uh, who may have uh, difficulty reading. The same is true for people um, for whom English is not their first language. Um, and yet, uh, if you are sent a paper ballot at home, how do you access it? Um, how, you know, do you, uh, is there someone at your home that you trust enough to read your ballot to you, to mark your ballot on your behalf, sign, sign your ballot, you know, and put it in the mail? I, that, that completely goes against uh, the, the right to cast an anonymous independent ballot, right? Technology is one solution to this. Uh, some states have <clears throat> what's called electronic ballot delivery systems where voters can receive their ballot online and it can be read via a screen reader. There are further issues that they then have to print out the ballot and sign it, which again is an access issue if you can't see where to sign something. Um, so one of the things that the disability community is advocating for is for further uh, expansion and investment in electronic voting systems. These are systems that we already use for um, <clears throat> active military service members who are serving overseas. They, they already vote online. Um, we're not necessarily saying that this is the way to go. We want more research and again, expansion and investment, but it's one of the ways that technology can really make our democracy as a whole more inclusive. Wonderful. Yeah, you know, I think as, as we're kind of talking about digital inclusion, the term itself clearly conveys the idea that there are people and places that have been historically excluded from the benefits of digital opportunity. And I think that you, you really kind of talked about um, the, the way the technology kind of intersects with, with the lives of, of people maybe uh, living with a disability. I know that, and you know what, I actually just live almost right next to Gallaudet University, which is, oh, cool. which is a university for yeah. um, the, the, the hearing impaired. Um, and I know that they use, you know, mobile devices to, to communicate, you know, to, with each other. And also, I think, with the outside world, right? As right. someone that I think lives in a community that, that, that is in kind of like surrounded by a campus of kind of like um, hearing impaired students, you know, I go to the coffee shop 
and 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 there's people that that are working and that have jobs and so i either have to kind of write my order down or or they call and they text me or we use our phone and so technology really plays you know an important kind of bridge um yep. within kind of like in, uh, to facilitate those interactions so and i think i don't know so one i think we're neighbors because i live uh in the same neighborhood oh perfect uh, yeah, but you know, t- texting, which you probably prefer to a phone conversation, texting was originally created for the deaf community. And it's an example of something that we like to call the curb cut effect in, in the disability community. Um, so curb cuts are you know, not necessarily tech, but curb cuts were originally li- literally created via sledgehammer by disability advocates in the 70s. And as we saw um, both policy and infrastructure investments in curb cuts, you know, today we see uh, parents with strollers, people carrying groceries, right? Like um, we used to see travelers with luggage, you know, all benefiting from curb cuts. And it's the same thing with with texting and an, an intervention, a tech intervention originally created to support, uh, you know, people who are who are deaf communicating is now the preferred method of communication for so many of us. Um, other examples include uh, speech recognition technology originally created for uh, the disability community. And now we all talk to Siri, we all talk to Alexa or our Google Home. Um, same thing with optical character recognition, the tools that we use to search documents, um, auto-complete, auto-texting. Those are all kind of disability tech interventions that thankfully have been mainstreamed. And that, <clears throat> one of the things that we see is that when something is created to be disability tech, it's often really expensive because it's not created on a, on a large scale. Um, so uh, there's a technology called Dragon Naturally Speaking that has been for decades the, the leader in speech to text technology and, and is still a real leader in this space. Dragon used to be so, so incredibly expensive for individuals with disabilities, but now that you have speech-to-text tools embedded in your mobile device, in your computer, um, the cost is much lower and everyone benefits. No, that is really great context to hear. And I think that that just speaks to, you know, all the technology that we all kind of take for granted that was specifically, I think, developed to kind of help uh, mitigate some, some of these, um, you know, life, you know, obstacles that I think people with disabilities might, might, might have. Um, mm-hmm. so, so I would say if we're thinking about achieving the goal of full digital inclusion and universal broadband adoption, we know that it's mm-hmm. going to take a collaborative and integrated approach with policymakers, private industry, and diverse st- stakeholders like AAPD, and in partnership with local communities. So I think from your perspective, are there some specific steps that Congress or regulators like the FCC can take to deliver real solutions for diverse communities across the country and achieve our shared goal of an inclusive tech future? One of the things, you know, the the FCC already has numerous regulations requiring accessible communications and connectivity, and we want to see further enforcement and enhancement of uh, those regulations. I believe we just celebrated the 10-year anniversary of the 21st Century Communications Act, um, which is the, the law that really created a sort of new standard for accessible communications across um, broadband and was a real uh, win for the disability community. Um, I think one of the things that that, um, is a a big concern is that as, um, is is that there's an enormous digital divide amongst people with disabilities and a lot of it has to do with the significant poverty that people with disabilities and specifically disabled people of color um, experience. You know, we, and this is real, disability is both a cause and consequence of of poverty. Um, And so, um, you know, we we wanna see broadband expanded to every community with, with the least barriers to that adoption. So there are a number of programs that folks can sign up for to get uh, you know, either lower rate access or free access, but they're not very well known. And um, I want to see both federal agencies and um, organizations like yours and others that focus on broadband adoption to 
uh, do meaningful engagement with the disability community to figure out, you know, how do we communicate in a way that um, really hits at what you need and um, not make any assumptions. That's the, that's the other thing. At AAPD, um, we are we are disability led. Um, many disability organizations are not actually led by disabled people. And so when you're thinking about the disability community, we should think about family members and caregivers. But um, if you want real engagement on these issues and you want to understand how access to broadband is affecting um, the disability community, make sure that people with disabilities are at the table speaking for ourselves. You're on mute. That is a uh, really important um, and I really appreciate you um, just being here and taking the time and know that HTTP stands with you and happy to collaborate in the future to ensure that again, you know, a tech, an inclusive tech future requires all of our voices working together. Um, and that really is the goal of, of, of this year's Digital Inclusion Summit. So I want to thank you again for this great conversation and to everyone that might be watching from home, uh, please make sure to um, to follow Maria on Twitter and of course <laughs> APD on Twitter. Please make sure, I'll make sure to link the information in the description below. And please also make sure to follow HTTP on our social channels at HTTP policy to be the first to hear about our upcoming conversations presented as a part of this year's Digital Inclusion Summit. So until then, please remember to tune into the conversation, speak out and stay connected because the future needs our help. Until next time, have a good one. Bye. Yeah!